Good morning. <laughs> I'm really, I'm really glad to see so many of you got up early to come see me today. That is, that is awesome. This talk is, I have a lot of slides. Actually, I have a lot more slides than I'm going to show you as well. So, because of time constraints, well, if you could save the questions until after, that would be awesome. And I will stay as long as you have questions after. Uh, I have numbered my slides, so you can just write down the number. You have a question about them, we can go back to them. So, my talk is about software vulnerabilities, but my goal today is more to put you in a place where you can feel that maybe you could try to do some investigations around vulnerabilities in your own code by making uh, an ex exploit to, to take advantage of a vulnerability and in that way demonstrate that it is exploitable. So my name is Patricia Oss. I am very recently a consultant. <laughs> But before that, I have worked on uh, two browsers, uh, the original Opera browser, uh, the Vivaldi browser. I also worked in embedded systems in Cisco on uh, telepresence products. And I also worked a short stint as a Java consultant. So this is the layout for today. Hopefully, we will get through everything. That's my goal. Uh, the, the ones in big fonts are the big sections. The other ones are kind of small. So let's get going. So undefined behavior. So how many of you are intimately familiar with undefined behavior? Awesome. <laughs> so I'm not going to read it since you know what it is. But basically, uh, anything can happen with undefined behavior. If you depend on undefined, undefined behavior, weird things can happen. And we're going to show a little small example of that. So. The most important thing that we have to conclude, and I'll show you the example in a second, is that you shouldn't reason about undefined behavior. We've had a culture where people would reason about it, thinking like, yeah, but my compiler will do this and that. And so you end up with code that depends on undefined behavior. But even changing the optimization level might actually change the, uh, the execution of your program. And this is an example of that. Here we have a very short function uh, with a little array with four elements in it. And inside of your for loop, there is an access outside of array bounds. It's not very easy to see. But at the last iteration of the loop, after di has been incremented, then there is an access outside of error bounds. Turns out, with optimizations turned on, this di is less than four, which is in green there, is assumed to be true because the undefined behavior, the compiler can assume that the undefined behavior never happens, and this turns into an infinite loop. If you want to try it, now is the time to take a picture. <laughs> OK? This is an example that Sh uh, Shafiq Yamour, who is here today, right there, uh, has he tweeted about it, but he's also answered on the Stack Overflow question. And he is uh, the Twitter expert on undefined behavior. <laughs> OK, so just a very short look at what kind of specs exist. Actually, there are a bunch of specs in the C++ secure coding uh, space. I'm not going to talk so much about those. I'm going to talk very quickly about three. Now, many of you might not consider the core guidelines to be about secure coding, but a lot of the developments inside of C++ is actually to make the language safer, and especially safer around memory access. And then you have the CERT, the C++ coding standard. Now what you will see that some of these are really big. It's not really meant to be read, and that also makes it a little bit difficult to deal with. But I will refer to these by name uh, throughout the presentation, so I'm just showing them. 
But this is probably the most important one today. It is uh, the common weakness enumeration. And I will refer to numbers there. So if you, if you want to look up a specific uh, vulnerability, you can look it up there, and it will have a longer description. OK, so we found out that undefined behavior was dangerous. OK, what about other types of compiler optimizations? This is the case of the disappearing memset. Now, this is also quite surprising, but it's also an actual security issue that happened to many different programs. The idea here is that you have some sort of secret that is stored on the stack. Then you do whatever you need to do with that secret on the stack, and then when you are finished with it, the idea is that you want to reset that memory. And you do that with this mem set to zero because you want to overwrite this part of memory to make sure that you don't leave the secret in memory. Unfortunately, this mem set is a dead store. Dead stores can be optimized away. So the mem set disappears and is never done. The fun part is, of course, it is done in debug, right? So if you do it in debug, it, it will actually reset it. It's just in release, your secret is still in memory. And if you want to give it a try, <laughs> now is the time to take a picture. I'll put the slides up, so you can, I'll put the slide up later tonight, so you can have a look. So what kind of solution exists for this? Actually, there's no good cross-platform solution for this. Um, there is some support for this memset underscore s, which is guaranteed not to be optimized away but it's not available everywhere. So if you have this in your products, in your whatever you make, in your systems, uh, I would look it up, and there's a lot of uh, good uh, suggestions on how you could do it for different platforms. But this is a real issue. OK, so now we come to the fun part. And this part I have never presented before. So this is going to be interesting. So we're going to do Exploit Development 101. And this is going to be based on a very famous article uh, from 1996, I believe, which is called Smashing the Stack for Fun and Profit. And it is the first, as far as I know, uh, written descriptions on how to do uh, stack overflows. And it had been done for a while before that, but this was the first one. Uh, in the actual article, he describes on how to do this on the 32-bit Linux. Uh, I made the examples on 64-bit Linux, uh, the latest Ubuntu. So if you want to see the actual coding uh, examples and run them yourself, they're on my GitHub. And I had some help on the security channel on the HashInclude Discord. So. Shout out to Vesim and HTHH for helping me out. OK, so before we start, a little pep talk. I will go through it slowly. It might seem a little bit overwhelming, but hopefully you'll understand it. So don't give up. This is our goal. Our goal is shell, like security people call it. So basically, we want the program that we are exploiting to give us the shell prompt. And this is uh, the way we're going to go about developing this. So the first step here is write C code for shell code. Shell code is the little payload, the little piece of code that you want to run when you have exploited this vulnerability. It's called shell code because traditionally it gave you shell, bash. Uh, today, shell code is more abstract in the security business. It can mean anything that you run natively on a machine. Uh, for example, on Windows, it's very, used, there, it's very common that it just launches calc, the calculator. <laughs> so it doesn't really do bash. The idea is to prove that you have uh, the opportunity to execute natively on the machine. 
So we're going to write the C code for the shell code. And then after compiling it, we're going to use the compiled code to try to write inline assembly and then tweak that as much as we can and, and until we have the actual bytes we want. Then we're going to put those bytes in a car buffer and then we're going to execute that car buffer. And that's the goal. Okay, so what we are going to use is this function or this system call called execve on Linux. Execve, this is a little bit different from platform to platform, but on Linux, this is how things work. You have a target process, and inside of that target process, you have a running program. This is the one that we want to exploit, so I'm calling it vulnerable program. Then based on getting the shellcode to run, we want to change this process into uh, the same process, but inside we want the running program to be bash. And that is what execve does. It, sub it substitutes the program in the current process with another program. And this is kind of important, so we're going to get back to it a lot of times, because basically we have to be able to construct this call in assembly. We're going to call execve with slash bin slash sh. Um, and we have to figure out how it is called. So, the, so this will depend on which architecture you're on um, and which version of, of, of Linux. My, well, yeah, it's at least which architecture and whether or not it's 32-bit and 64-bit. But for 64-bit Linux on x86, this is what it looks like. So you have to have the syscall number and RAX, that's the registers the ones that are here. In RDI, we need a pointer to the file name. In RSI, we need the argv, and RDX, we need the NP. NP is the environment, which is an array of mapped values, like if you do N. So basically, this is what we want. We want to make this small stack-based array, and then we want to use things in that to call execve. So this is our shell code. So we're going to compile that, and then based on that, we're going to try to extract uh, the characters we're going to put in our array. So we're going to skip a little bit ahead, and I've already like prepared some assembly for you. So the first part of the assembly is, is the logic. So we're going to look at the beginning and the end. There are 10 lines of assembly we're going to go through in total. These are four of those 10 lines. So the first one says uh, that you want to jump to a label called push string, which is the second to last. And push string will actually call back up again to pop string. So this looks kind of weird. But the idea here is that when we have the string, the actual bin <coughs> sh, is under the call instruction. Now, when you do, when you execute the call instruction, what happens is that the address of the next instruction is pushed on the stack because that is the return address. This is the trick here because we don't know the address of the string in memory. So we use the call instruction to push that address onto the stack. Okay, so now you have the address of the stack. It has been pushed, the address on the, of, of, um, of our string has been pushed on the stack. So we're, we just call back up to pop string. Pop string pops it off the stack, and now we have the address of the string in RDI. Okay? So we've gotten this far. Now you're gonna get the rest of it. <laughs> we're gonna go through it though. So basically here we're tracking what is in what registers and what we need to get there. So you'll see that I have two XORs here and the XORs are ways of setting these registers to zero without actually using a zero byte. And the reason why we don't want a zero byte is that the thing that we are producing, our character buffer in the end, can't have any zero bytes because then we can't use any string functions. 
any kind of C string functions will assume that a zero byte is the end of the string and then it won't copy our entire shellcode. So we can't have any zero bytes. So we have on line five and six, you have two XORs to zero out two registers. And then, let's see, we'll continue. Because what we need to do now is we want to construct this array on the stack. And this is where we do that. Um, we are moving the address of the stack pointer into RSI. And RSI, you can see on the left here, is what, uh, the pointer to argv. So basically, we're saying that the pointer to argv is actually the stack pointer currently. And then we're going to actually write our array on the stack. And that's what the next two instructions are doing. The first one is, is moving what is in RDX uh, to the stack pointer plus eight. And that is null because we just set it to zero. And the reason for that is, let's see if I go back again. The calling convention for XXVE says that you have to have an array to pass, but the array has to be null terminated. It's a thing. You just have to have one more element and the last element has to be null. So we have to put an actual null in our stack array. Uh, but in the other, in the first position, we are going to put our string. So basically, this is what it looks like. We have in our registers, uh, we have the address of our string. In RDX, we have null, which we can use for many different things. In RAX, we have put, well, I, 3B, which is 59, which is the number of the syscall. And in RSI, we have this pointer. <coughs> the pointer points to this thing on the stack, which is our stack-based array, which is, has a pointer to our string and null. And this is what we need to do our syscall. So we just call syscall. Syscall will pick up the syscall number from RAX, which we wrote in, the, in uh, line 10. And then it will use the values as on the left to actually do the actual syscall. And we will execute <laughs> in the vulnerable process, replacing the vulner vulnerable process with bash and getting shown. That is the idea. And this is the fundamental idea in any type of exploit that you want to put some sort of code somewhere in this process and you want to execute it in some way. And right now we're doing uh, this on the stack, but it could be anywhere else in memory and then you would use different techniques. I, I did a course in, um, in like, complexity theory. Uh, and not to give anybody imposter syndrome, it wasn't that useful. <laughs> but they have an interesting technique in, a technique in complexity theory, which is basically that you reduce a problem to another problem and then you say you're finished. Uh, this doesn't work in programming, we actually have to solve the other problem too. But, but the interesting thing is in, in security, this is something they often do because you have already fixed solutions for several parts. So we are going to do a very simple thing here, but in real life, you will generally have many different techniques to achieve your goal. And especially as, as operating systems are adding uh, security measures, then you need different techniques. And many of these are known, so you can basically download them off online and that's where you get your script kiddies from. Okay, so now we have decided what our code should look like. We've compiled it, we've run it, so we know it works. Okay, so now we have to construct our character array because we actually want a string, right? So we do object dump, and we take a look at what that looks like. We grep for main, and this is our code. And this 
these are our bytes. And so I split it up so they match each line. And this is the shell code that corresponds to our assembly. So, okay, so fine. Now we have a character buffer, so what? We haven't done anything. What we need is to execute it, to see that you can actually execute our character array. In this case, I wrote, wrote this very um, construed program, and the idea here is that I want to replace the return address of main with the address of our jump instruction. That's our first instruction. So what the idea is that when main returns, it will execute the instruction that is pointed to by its own return instruction, which we have now replaced with a pointer to our jump instruction. And then it will give us shell. Of course, this is a very construed example. I made the program. <laughs> But this is the idea, and this is what we're trying to do. But, you know, there wasn't any Stack Overflow here. I didn't actually do any Stack Overflow, but that we will get to how we will do that, and that's the next part of the, of the talk. But first, to understand how that could work, it's very important to understand the weirdness of addressing. Because when you write, in C and C++, you can plus plus on the address and you will increment it, and so the next byte has a higher address than the last byte. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, actually, the stack grows the other way. So the stack grows towards lower addresses. So when you write to an array, you are writing, if you write to an array on the stack, you're writing down on the stack. Even though you're writing forward, you're, it's down on the stack. Which means that whenever you have a stack-based array, if you write to it and you write over the end of it, you will continue down the stack, which is valid memory. The other thing also, well, oh yeah, and here, here you can see the idea of, uh, of writing the shell code. So I'm overwriting this piece of the stack. And in the beginning, you could have this section of no op, because at a certain point, you have to actually jump to this part of the code. And if you have a bunch of no ops, then you have a bigger section you can hit, and then, and then just no op your way over to our jump instruction. So you don't have to hit the jump instruction precisely. And this is called a, a no op sled, where you basically just slide into the shell code. Um, so our shell code is there in the middle, but at the end, we want to actually write the address to point back into our no ops or on our jump. Because we're trying to overwrite the return address of something so that it will jump to the beginning and execute our code. Because code is also executed in a positive fashion, like the next instruction is one more than the last instruction. So that is the idea. Now we're going to look at different types of vulnerabilities and what they might look like in code. And these are the ones we're going to go through. And uh, so you have unsigned integer wraparound, signed integer overflow, numeric truncation, stack buffer overflow, heap buffer overflow, buffer underflow, use after free, double free, incorrect type, to type conversion, and uncontrolled format string. And the code is on GitHub. <laughs> okay, so we're going to look at these numbers first. So this code is a little bit long, but they're going to, it's going to reappear a couple of times, so we'll spend a little bit of time on it. So basically you have three lengths. First length, second length, and buff length. And the idea here that what we are trying to, to demonstrate is an unsigned integer wraparound. Unsigned integer wraparound is well defined. It will just wrap. Uh, unfortunately, in this case, we are trying to test whether or not we will fit in buff by adding the first length to the second length and checking if it is smaller than buff size. But since we, in this case, very 
construed example, we have set first length to be big. When you add second length to first length, this will wrap. And it will wrap to a number that is smaller than 256, which will allow us to enter this guard and write longer. Because the idea here, when you want a stack overflow, uh, is that you want to be able to write beyond the end, right? So sometimes people put up little ifs to try to protect you, but then you can use unsigned integer wraparound to get past their checks. And that's the idea here as well. Except here, of course, signed integer overflow is undefined behavior. Uh, but on my machine, it's negative. So, if you add first length to second length, you end up with a negative number, which is, of course, less than, under, uh, less than 256, and so we go in again. So then you have numeric truncation error. And what you will see with all of these is that basically they're used to pass, to get through these ifs, right, that are supposed to protect against someone doing exactly what we want to do. And this is what I meant earlier about these things are chained. They're not using just one thing. You're using many different techniques to solve different problems. And here you have numeric truncation because we have two ints and uh, we are adding them, uh, two unsigned ints, and we're adding them together and putting them inside of an int, which doesn't fit. In my case, it turns negative, and negative number is less than 256. And we go in again. So then you have the, the overflows, or underflows, and some of them are quite obvious. Gets, actually, it's funny, if you, today, using gets is really hard. You actually have to jump through some hoops, uh, because gets has, has uh, a whole section on don't use gets. <laughs> uh, so you have to turn off some warnings, and you really have to really try hard to use it. Um, because it has its own common vulnerability number, just for gets. It's like inherently dangerous function. <laughs> but here we are reading from standard input into a buffer on our stack. And gets will not check if it fits. So you can just write in. Then we have heap-based buffer overflow. Now the idea here is now instead we have a buffer on the heap that we're trying to overflow. The idea is the same, of course, that we want to execute this memory, this string that we've written on the heap, and we still have to do what we did before. We have to have a way of, of setting some kind of jump instruction or call instruction to this part of memory. But it's pretty much the same idea. And in this case, of course, we're taking an argument that we haven't checked and just copying it into some part of memory that it doesn't fit. Okay, so then you have buffer of underwrite uh, and, or underflow, and that's basically the other way. So usually it's like you're writing outside of array bounds, you're writing outside of the end. In this case, we are writing outside the beginning. Now this could also be interesting, like I said before, that it's very useful to write this when you have, um, because of the addressing on the stack, it is nice to write outside of the end because that is going to give you the opportunity to overwrite the return instruction. But sometimes you want to overwrite a buffer that is placed before you. That's where you actually want to write. So in that case, you want to write the other direction because it depends on which buffer you have access to, right? And these ones are what we normally call regular bugs, but they can also be exploited, so we'll just look at them, but uh, very quickly. A use after free, I'm sure everyone has had a use after free at some point, <laughs> especially if you're writing old style C++. And uh, double-free is also something that uh, 
has happened to people. Now, if you want to see exactly how these things are vulnerable, you can also go look at, at, uh, at some of these numbers that I mentioned, because we don't have time to go through everything. And then you have incorrect type conversion cast and use of external format string. Now, the last one is very famous. And I also have with, I brought with me a book that if you want to have a look at some of these things afterwards. Incorrect type conversion is also something that is interesting. Something that you can do in C and C++ that you can't do in other languages is you can cast a piece of memory to something totally different which is kind of cool. <laughs> but it also means that, let's say that uh, I could make my own type, and I could cast your memory of your type to mine, and then I can manipulate that memory much more easily. And then this one, which is uh, quite famous, and be used in many different ways. This is like the C, C++ version of SQL injection. It's basically take a string that you can't trust and then use it as trusted input to actually access memory, because that's the interesting part here, right? If you send in a format string which has more insertion points than you actually have, then here I'm going to pass hello world, and then, unfortunately, I didn't have a number after. And so I'm just going to read the next thing on the stack and write it out. And this is a nice way to get, like, to be able to read random parts of memory, right? Because you can just pass whatever and read random bits of memory. It's a good way of figuring out addresses and, and information that you would like to get out of the process. Okay, so I should have probably made a whole presentation which was basically about what you should do, but I didn't. <laughs> but of course, what you should do is to take your vitamins, right? To, do, to use several compilers, to, add, to compile on different optimization levels, to treat warnings as errors, have lots of tests, and um, use all of your sanitizers and all of these things. Uh, but what we see, of course, is that a lot of the errors that we make are logical errors. Logical errors like taking input and trusting it. And to do stuff like that, you basically come down to fuzzing, where fuzzing you just send in lots of things, uh, hoping that it will trigger something. And then when you found some, a bug triggered, then you can go back to trying to make an exploit, try to exploit it in some way to prove that it is exploitable. The interesting thing here is that this is, even if you can't prove that something is exploitable, doesn't mean it isn't exploitable, right? It just means you couldn't. So when I made this talk, the first one, not this one, because this one is way more technical. <laughs> uh, but when I made the first one, I wanted to, to show people that um, you should write C++ in a modern way, because that eliminates a lot of these problems. Because what you saw in the exploitability is that it was largely C code, right? We can write C in C++. But these are my, I'd really rather you didn't. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Pastafarianism. <laughs> they have something they call the eight condiments. <laughs> They're really nice, you should Google them. But anyway, um, I had to put this in because some people were provoked. Uh, <laughs> because these are my uh, eight, I'd really rather you didn't. <laughs> I'd really rather you didn't use C. <laughs> I'd really rather you didn't allocate with new. I'd really rather you didn't do math a lot. I'd really rather you didn't trust your external input. I'd really rather you didn't use pointers a lot. I'd really rather you didn't write clever code. 
I'd really rather you didn't use SharePoint to log on. And I'd really rather you didn't share state a lot. And this is actually the most important one. So this is, if you can use C++, then take advantage of the facilities in the language. A large part of the developments in C++ has been based on the fact that it has been known as a vulnerable language, and still is. And when you see uh, example, or you'd see at the excerpts of code that is in various uh, ex uh, descriptions of vulnerabilities, it looks like the code you saw. It's C. Even if they say like, yeah, it was in a C++ application and they give a little snippet of the actual code that was vulnerable, it is like nine out of 10 times, it's C. It's C manipulating strings most of the time. So we have facilities in the language to do this safely. I'm not going to go through a lot of it here. I did when I presented this to people who don't know C++ as well as you. I'd really rather you didn't allocate with new. And the reason for that is as we have experienced through the development of our language, is that it makes you more vulnerable to all sorts of things. It is very difficult to do it correctly, although we have prided ourselves in doing it correctly. Uh, it's also very difficult to have new people brought into the projects who don't know the language as well. And, and this is where the court guidelines come in a lot, because this is the development of our programming culture. I'd really rather you didn't do math a lot. And when I say that, it's because really, surprisingly, computers are really bad at doing math. <laughs> it's because we, we don't have a good representation of numbers. Numbers don't make sense in computers. Numbers have fixed size. But numbers, mathematical numbers, do not have fixed size. And then we show up with our floating point numbers, and that's like a whole other type of hell. We cannot do math well in computers. And it's very unfortunate because this is how we teach programming. Like the first slide in like programming class is like add one to two. And I would say try to avoid doing math. And how could you do that? Like how could you avoid doing math? Well, the, like you have the, the, the old good old fashioned for loop that has math in it, right? So don't do that. We have the for each loop now, but even better, do the algorithms, right? Do map, do reduce, do filter, stop doing math. But we also have like, if you want to have numbers to represent something, then give them semantics, because numbers don't have any semantics. Like you can add how old I am with how much I weigh, and I'm not exactly sure what that turns out to be, but it's perfectly valid. It is a number, right? But it doesn't mean anything. So then you could use things like string literals to represent numbers, and then in that way give them semantics, give them actual types. You have things like enum classes instead of enums, because old style C enums can easily give, give you undefined behavior by casting some value that isn't in the enum, which is not possible with enum classes. It's also possible with old fashioned enums using the wrong enum because it's just an int, right? I love a language that can re reduce everything to an int. <laughs> Especially because ints aren't that great. It's like ints in C++ isn't even like, you don't even know what size they are. It's, it's a crazy thing. So I'd really rather you didn't trust your in external input because one of the big things that you need when you make an exploit is you need to get something that you have into this application somehow. And that's when you're talking about the attack surface of an application. You have things like the, the command line arguments, that's a way to get it in. You have the environment, you can, uh, that, that is an exploit class where you put your shellcode in an environment variable, 
and then you read that in when you've gotten somewhere. Uh, but you have things like if you're parsing uh, buffers that you're getting over the network, this could be media, this could be network traffic. Here you have lots of fun strings that are being sent into the application. A lot of the vulnerabilities that have happened to media applications is actually in handling the media buffers that come in. And, and very often, what you will see there is that what they're messing with are the numbers again, because you often have in the header something that says, okay, this next section is this, this many bytes. So this is your opportunity to lie, right? I'd really rather you didn't use pointers a lot. And this, of course, we've gotten to the point where this is something that we do. Some people disagree with me. They think, if it is not an owning pointer, it is OK. The problem with a pointer in C and C++ is that it isn't like a pointer in other languages. In other languages, a pointer is more of an abstract concept. A pointer in C and C++ is a virtual memory address of raw memory, I don't know what it is. You gave it to me, you're saying it's a person, I don't know if there's a person there. I don't know if there ever was a person there. A pointer in C and C++ is not a good construct in programming, in my opinion. Because when you get it, you don't know anything about the state of that memory. You don't even know if it is what it says it is. I'd really rather you didn't write clever code. And this is kind of a difficult one because we had this, uh, this idea of not writing premature optimizations. And I totally agree. No premature optimizations. It's basically because most of the code you write, you throw away again, so it's an absolute waste of time. Uh, but also because, but at the same time, I think you shouldn't write stupid code either, right? So you have to keep it in mind. But very often, people just go out of their way to make things fancy when they don't need to. Like, you have people who are like, oh, I'm going to shave two milliseconds off my command line parser. How often does that run? <laughs> and... The problem is things like your command line parser, this is where you're getting external strings, right? This is not the code you want to be convoluted. So to make it easier to review, to make it easier to make changes in safely, to make it easier for people to understand it, simpler code is better code. Simpler code is safer code. I'd really rather you didn't use shared pointer a lot. Now we've gotten to this point. I think most people, like, okay, so who is in favor of shared pointers? Sorry, I shouldn't have said that. I should have said the other thing. Who is, who agrees with this slide? <laughs> Thank you. That was a good way to frame the question. And, and this is difficult to tell. I put this up because we're getting people to into C++ that are coming from other languages and managing their own memory is not something they're used to. And shared memory sounds like a really good idea. Shared pointer sounds like a really good idea. Because it's like, okay, then I don't have to handle it, right? But the problem, of course, with shared, mem shared pointer is that you now have really no idea what the lifetime of this thing is. And since memory is a very critical thing in C and C++, well, in this case, C++ applications, we have grown a culture where we have to know who owns our memory, who is taking care of the lifetime. And in the past, that was like, now we are managing that lifetime on the stack. And we take really good care. I'm not saying there are no use cases for, for uh, shared pointer. There are, but I'm not. I'm also saying it's not as much as some people would like it to be. I'd really rather you didn't share state a lot. The first time I wrote this slide, I said I'd really rather you didn't use threads a lot. It's. <laughs> 
And the reason, the reason is because of the shared state, right? It's, it's hard to do right. It's very easy to do wrong. Uh, but then I reduced it to I'd really rather you didn't share state a lot because that is the problem, right? A lot of the race conditions, a lot of the bugs and vulnerabilities that are around threading are around race conditions for shared state. So if you have no shared state, you know, go wild. I don't care. But if you do have, <laughs> if you do have shared state, and the thing is shared state has a tendency to creep up on you. You know, you start off and you're like, oh, everything's separate, everything's great. And then somebody comes in and goes like, oh, yeah, but I need this thing. And they don't have the mental model of the threads. The threads are not like exactly like neon in your code, right? You don't necessarily understand by reading the code that this code and this code are running always in separate threads. It's very easy to make the mistake of introducing shared state by accident. And this is also something that I think is important for us to think about, is that code is not what I wrote right now. Code is what it evolves to over time. And that was actually my presentation. So I do have a little bit of time. So maybe we will do questions now anyway. So do you want me to go back to the shell code? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, first, thank you. I have a feeling that's where we're going to end up, right? <laughs> okay, let's go back. Because that's the fun part, isn't it? No. Yes. The one part I didn't understand, so you, you, have the buffer overflow, how do you make uh, the return code go to, into your code if you don't know where your code is in okay. the first place? Let's see. So you want to overwrite the return address with something that's... Yeah. Uh, no, that is, that is a good question and that is the hard part. Uh, previously in Linux, uh, before uh, address space layout randomization, uh, you could guess pretty easily because the stack was in one place uh, and it was the same across runs and so it was quite easy to guess. Guessing that is also a separate technique mm -hmm. uh, and you can use several different techniques and there's like a whole section in the book. <laughs> but, but yes, address space layout randomization made that more difficult, yeah. Yes? So I was just curious, um, you know, when generating the code, I don't even know if this is possible because I just thought of it, but I was wondering if it was possible to maybe generate the code with like an LLVM JIT, if anyone's ever tried that, versus like trying to go through this very convoluted process of like, you know, it, it's just an idea. I didn't know if you knew anybody had tried. I don't know, but you know, give it a go. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, and uh, well, he was up there. He asked if, if uh, someone uh, had, um, had tried to use an LLVM JIT to, to make shell code. Uh, great presentation. One question yet. Uh, it's about uh, memory protection. How to deal with it is if we can, for example, if our memory, for example, not executable, but we need to jump on it. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, about memory protection. Yeah. And to, uh, how to deal with it when we can't try to execute the memory. Yeah. Well, in, 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 he's asking about memory protection. And this is also one of the places where operating systems have gotten better, right? Uh, one of the things that I had to, uh, I had to turn off a few things to make this work, right? The first thing I have to turn off is, uh, stack canaries. Uh, and, uh, Matt talked a little bit about stack canaries yesterday. Stack canaries are turned on by default, and stack canaries is basically a little piece uh, on the stack, and if and when you return from function before you do the return, which will actually execute the return instruction, it checks if this stack canary has been overwritten. So that's nice. It makes this harder. Uh, another thing that has also happened in Linux is that you have set the stack to not be executable. It's kind of hard to execute instructions on the stack when it's not executable. 
And you've gone further even and made large parts of memory not executable. And that's also something that makes things harder. But it hasn't really stopped. And like I said before, a very lot of the techniques, there are chaining, right? So you will have one technique to try to figure out what the address layout has been randomized to. So that's a whole one set of techniques. And now you've suddenly realized what the offset is, and you can do calculations based on that. Uh, you have exploits that go specifically on making pages in memory executable. So then you worked around that one. Um, so there are many techniques and they are used together to create the final exploit. The interesting fact is that the exploits are very similar. But another thing that we've also gotten is something called return to libc or uh, uh, return oriented programming where you are using existing code which is already in memory, which is valid and is executable and you're using that code by jumping around to execute what you want. Okay, thank you. Yes. More questions? No? Okay. Thank you. Thank you.